Uh, so welcome everyone to the last day of this ZK EVM audit education session. So today we're going to have four talks. So this the topic of today's session is to uh, share some of the experience of the uh, ZK EVM development as well as some other uh, in uh, other ZK circuits uh, development in general, some lessons we learn uh, doing auditing and then something like we think that'll be uh, very easy or uh, prone to errors. So basically people are going to share a bunch of uh, things like they have uh, during the ZK uh, circuits development. So first we'll have Barry to talk about uh, the claims. So he wants to think the ZK, aud ZK even auditing needs to verify. And then Jose and Jordi were going to share some of the auditing preparation and then some bugs in the ZK EVM. Uh, Andrew from EF also are going to talk about the challenge API that we modify in the Halo 2. Um, and then a little bit about the ZK EVM Python specs that we develop. And then last, Aureo from Scroll will talk about uh, some special behavior in the, the Scroll ZK EVM and some considerations. So first I'll give the time to to Barry to talk about, uh, to, uh, to give his talk. Thank you, Hi Chen. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so like Hai Chen said today, I wanna to talk about the claims that we wanna verify. And I'll also talk a little bit about some of the mistakes that we found along the way. Um, so this talk is like 30 minutes, but I, I think we'll have time for questions at the end, but also feel free to jump in with questions as we're going. Um, if I, like this can become more of a discussion than like a presentation if people have things they wanna talk about. So feel free to jump in. Uh, so let me just introduce the topic a little bit. So when we're auditing things, we wanna, verify claims and we want the the claims that we're verifying to be really strong like for example we want to say that the zk evm is unhackable that's not a very useful claim because we don't really know what hackable means but we do want to verify things about like it's impossible to take money out of the zk evm or like there is this like implicit set of claims that we all kind of have in our mind but there's also oh let me go to full screen um, where is that? Huh. Anyway, let me just keep going. So like we all have like these implicit claims that we have in our mind. And like the goal of today's talk is to point out some other uh, claims or some other things that we want to verify. So I talked earlier about like, how we want to make the ZKVM unhackable. And like one big part of that is validity, that we want to make sure that like invalid state transitions are impossible, that from the state before and the state after, there's you have to follow the rules of the EVM. Uh, this is the validity claim that we want to verify. And let's like, like let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So, Validity is really capturing a bunch of different things. That validity captures, oh, we don't want to do invalid state transitions, but it also captures things about like solidity smart contracts. For example, the ZKVM is, is going to execute these smart contracts. And these contracts are built by people who don't know anything about the ZKVM. They know things about the EVM and they make smart contracts that's secure in the EVM. And like the assumptions that they're carrying over needs to be enforced in the ZK EVM. So when we start to, so let me give an example. So let's say that like we finish ZK EVM and we find that everything is totally fine. The ZK EVM is unhackable. But if someone deploys like a common smart contract like Uniswap, that contract is not completely covered by the by the ZK AVM rules. Like this is another thing that we need to be super careful about. And like one example of this is that like the, the ZK AVMs that we're auditing right now are, are, are not 100% EVM compatible. And like we learned from previous experience that when we change the EVM, even in a small way, it has these like huge cascading changes. 
um, like one example of this was like repricing some gas opcode broke a whole bunch of smart contracts. There was a bunch of smart contracts that, that would give like 10,000 gas to do a whole bunch of uh, operations. And when the 10,000 gas wasn't enough, it, it failed. The contract wasn't able to kind of continue. So yeah, so that kind of broke a bunch of smart contracts. And like, this is something that we need to keep in mind when we're all in the KVM that, that like the assumptions that the developers have are, are, are different from, from like, they could be different from what we have or like what the ZK AVM provides. And let's dig a little bit deeper into this. So like we have to be aware of like this contract that people are building and like how they're using the EVM when we're auditing the ZK AVM because the ZK AVM is different. And like those differences could affect a lot the security of some contracts. Going one step deeper, we have to think about like the Solidity language itself because the Solidity contracts don't talk directly to the EVM. They go through the Solidity compiler where the Solidity compiler does a whole bunch of things and produces this EVM bytecode. And that's what the EVM interprets. And there's a whole bunch of assumptions in the Solidity language that we need to be careful about too. One example of this is that the ZKA EVM uses snark friendly hash functions for the storage uh, or, or the, 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 the two audit candidate or the two release candidates do. And Solidity assumes that, that like you're using Kajak for this. And like the guarantees of these two different hash functions are different. It's not clear how collision or how, how pseudo random the, the snark friendly hash function is. So one potential attack is that you could try and fill up the Merkle Patricia tree by producing a whole bunch of like non-random values uh, with, so with, right. So, so let me slow down and just expand on that a little bit. So like the way that the, the way that the, the, the storage tree works is that like items are like randomly assigned like the depth of the tree is, is, is variable. And if you're able to like put items in really inconvenient places in the tree, then you can make the tree grow very deep. And that could be a problem. Um, like I know now, I, I also it's important to remember that this is probably not the best example because I, if I understand correctly, both of the release candidates have have different different storage trees, which might have like a fixed depth. And if they have a fixed depth, then this kind of changes the, the, the assumptions here a bit. But it's also important to remember because Solidity uses this for mappings, right? Solidity will, when Solidity does a mapping, it will, it will kind of like randomly assign the value that's mapped to a position in the tree and then just map that position to one. And like, this is another thing, this is another solidity assumption that we need to be super careful about because with the ZKVM, it's because this is changing something that solidity had assumed was going to be different. And this is, this is another place where I think we could find some bugs when we're looking at the interfaces of like these three different systems that we're talking about. So another thing to remember, oh yeah, so this is kind of a fun uh, example of how these three things come together. So when we were making ZKVM, we thought about removing gas, right? We thought that like, oh, why do you need to have gas? Isn't like the size of a proof an implicit gas limit? Why not just remove it? And that would help everybody. But it turns out that gas is a really important security feature. And gas is used in ZKVM. Gas is used in EVM by Solidity developers to, to limit what a certain contract can do. It's also used by Solidity. So when in Solidity, you have two ways of sending money. Well, you have more, but like, let's just say two. You have transfer and you have call. And transfer is, is the safe way. This transfer protects you from this so-called re-entrancy attacks, which is just such a huge common bug. And... Transfer protects you against this, whereas call doesn't. And like, how does this work? Well, Solidity, there is no transfer opcode in the ZKV, in, in the EVM. 
what Solidity does is whenever it sees a transfer, it kind of replaces that with a call that has this gas limit. It says you can do a call and whatever you do inside that call has to be 2000 gas, no more. And if gas disappeared, if we decided to say, oh, gas isn't important, we can get rid of gas, then every transfer will become like a re-entrancy attack vector, right? Because we would remove the protection. The protection here is the gas limit because 2000 gas isn't enough to do a re-entrancy attack because it's not enough to do another call. So, so that's why, yeah, let me, yeah, let me finish and then I'll explain a little bit more about a re-entrancy attack. Um, so if gas disappeared, then it would be it would be a really big issue. So like this is an example of where like the three things I talked about kind of connect and make the zkVM sort of vulnerable. Uh, and this is th th this kind of interface between three different systems is is somewhere where I think we need to be really, really careful. Uh, yeah. So like a, a basically, I, I don't know like if people know what a re-entrancy attack is, but basically a re-entrancy attack is where you do, you call one contract and then that contract calls the original caller and does something else. Uh, that's a re-entrancy attack. But anyway, that's not super important to worry about. Uh, it, I, I think everyone is up to date on these kind of attacks. And if not, you can just Google it. It's, it there's a lot of information about them out there. Okay, uh, so let me give some conclusions for the first part of the talk. Um, the first conclusion is that like what we're assuming is is much, much bigger than the, than the yellow paper. Um, the assumptions we're also inheriting from like common smart contract practices and the solidity language. Uh, those are two other assumptions that we need to be super careful about. Also, if we do, if we invite uh, developers to deploy any contract on ZKVM, we have to be sure that the changes in the ZKVM don't make those contracts vulnerable. Uh, and as we learned from like hard folks before, we have to be very, very careful about the, the changes that we make. So that's the first part of the talk. Uh, the second part is about liveness. So we said we talked about making the ZKVM unhackable. The other major thing that we want to do is, is, is talk about is the is the guarantee liveness. And this means that like you can't pause the system. Uh, pausing the system is like making it impossible for a user to withdraw or breaking a smart contract, make a smart contract uh, that like in the EVM would, would be able to continue operating, but in ZKVM it's kind of frozen or paused. Like these are these are the, the liveness guarantees that we want to, to, to check. We want to make sure that the system is unpausable and, and we have to make sure that like deposits and withdrawals are unpausable and also that like on the contract level. There's no way to, to break a contract that's deployed. Uh, yeah, so another so the first thing to talk about here is like the gas, gas, gas price changes. There's some gas price changes included in ZK in the, the release candidates. And we want to we want to make sure that the old gas price changes don't break other smart contracts or other common smart contracts. Uh, like one example of this is that like I don't know if people still use this pattern in solidity. But like, it's often the case where you have like a limited amount of gas and you need to do a whole bunch of things. And people definitely still use this pattern where, where you have a limited amount of gas, you wanna do a whole bunch of things. And like, if we change the gas price and you're not able to do all of those things, or if we change the like implicit gas price and you're not able to do all of those things, then this contract is broken. And like, this is extra difficult because DeFi kind of has this pattern of like composing a whole bunch of different contracts together in like arbitrary ways. And like, if you're able to build like this kind of string of calls that you're ordinary, that you need to do, like Ave needs to call Uniswap and Uniswap needs to call, I don't know, another one. And like, then you go back and you go through this cycle and like, you need to do a whole bunch of these different things. If those kind of things are broken, then that can break like some downstream DeFi smart contracts. So gas price changes need to be very carefully considered. And like searching for these like places where gas prices are broken will be, is, is something we should definitely do. I don't know if that fits into like uh, ZKVM auditing or not, but like uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, we should definitely do that. Uh, yeah, and okay. So basically like if a contract or if like a chain of contracts get paused, that can be really bad. Like that can that can break the like liveness guarantee. That can yeah, that can break the like 
like you, like if Dai got paused, that would be an, a disaster. Or if Uniswap got paused, that would be a disaster. And like that's a worst case scenario. But like there's other there's other scenarios where like it's a little bit it's not as bad, but it's still terrible. Um, and that's where like you have like oh I have this contract that that's dependent upon Uniswap and Dai and it works on mainnet, but on 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 uh, on uh, zk evm it doesn't work like that's another uh, thing that we have to be super careful about we have this like the other thing to mention is that like i think that like the there's gas block there's gas price and then there's implicit gas price that like there's the explicit gas price and then there's the actual gas price that exists and like that's maybe another thing to worry about the economics of like oh i'm able to make this block so and I'm only able to include like 10 of these opposts. That means that like economically, this thing, the fees are gonna be a bit higher for this transaction. Uh, but yeah, anyway, there's just be careful about the implicit gas price as well as the explicit gas price. Um, yeah. And like, I, maybe that's a good, maybe that's a good output from the auditing to have a list of, to have like a mapping of the implicit gas price to the explicit gas price. I think that that would be a really good, exercise to sort of get familiar with like with like the actual cost of these different upcodes cool and like the implicit gas price is broken into two pieces like the first part of the implicit gas price is the prover cost and the call data gas cost like both of those things will affect the implicit gas cost the other major thing is that like if there's a per block limit on certain upcodes then that also imposes an implicit block, an implicit gas cost because you have this, you you have this like limited resource that you need to make a full proof for, and that has like overhead and things that need to be included in the implicit gas cost. But anyway, that, that I would be really interested to see implicit gas cost numbers. Uh, the other thing is data availability. Um, I'm getting to the end of the talk. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, the other thing is data availability. So and the, the idea here is that like, if I perform a state transition where the new state data is not known to other people, like if I'm the only person who knows that new state, then I am basically, I pause the system and I can demand a ransom from people in order to publish the state. People are like, I, I think that like the, a lot of rollups have these like forced withdrawal mechanisms. And if the, if this data is not available, available, you could break the forced withdrawal mechanism. And basically what is the claim that we want to guarantee here and the claim here i think is basically uh data availability claim and so there's two claims here there's data availability which means that like you publish all like the the the, the correct call data that you've consumed in the block and the second claim here is that like the the result of the state transition of that block is completely determined by by the call data that you published. And so, so let me dig a little bit deeper into like why completely determined is important because if I'm able to include some like random state alteration in that block, that means that no one else is gonna be able to, that, that means that like I can hide the new state. I can make it impossible for people to know what the new state is. Even if it's just like one bit of difference, you're able to make like multiple blocks. And after you make multiple blocks, it's gonna become harder and harder for people to calculate the new state. Uh, yeah, so data availability is a super important uh, guarantee. Um, and this is, this is one thing that we've changed. This is potentially the biggest change that's not gonna go away. And that's that like data availability cost is, is considerably different. That it used to be that optimizing smart contracts, you wanted to optimize for the computation cost. But now when you're optimizing smart contracts for optimism or for optimistic rollups or for ZK rollups, you end up optimizing for call data. You want to minimize the data that's published because that's the that's the biggest cost. And that means that like the, the gas costs of all the opcodes change considerably. That call data becomes super expensive and everything else becomes really cheap. And like, that's another thing that we should be careful about when we think about uh, uh, the, the topic of like gas price changes, that call data gas prices are huge. They get a lot bigger. And the implicit amount of call data is also bounded by the layer one gas block limit. 
That's the, uh, those are the only operations that are bounded by the layer one. And that's another, that's another super important thing to, to be careful about and to think about. Okay, so that's, that's the end of, my, of what I prepared to talk about. Um, let me go through the conclusions. So there, there's a bunch of things we want to be careful about. And it's not just about the EVM's assumptions and verifying things that the ZKVM matches the EVM. There's, I find that like when I'm auditing things, it's always at the interface of systems where, where we find issues. And here we have the interface of three different systems built by different people who didn't talk to each other and are like just random people on the internet in some cases. It's Solidity developers, the Solidity compiler developers, and the ZK EVM developers. And if the ZK EVM is broken and the EVM is broken, that's good. If a certain smart contract is broken in the ZK EVM and the EVM, that's good. If it's broken in the EVM and not in the ZK EVM, that's a, that's a validity issue, right? And if it's broken in the ZK EVM and not in the EVM, that's bad, that's a liveness issue. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of things to be careful about. I would focus on the place where the three systems meet, where Solidity developers are assuming something about Solidity, Solidity is assuming something about the EVM, and the ZK EVM doesn't satisfy that assumption. That would be that would be where I would focus my my efforts. So okay, I've got some. That's the end of my talk. I got some time for for questions now. If people want to ask me about stuff. Do you know of anything in particular that is? not well specified in the yellow paper or that's different in practice okay so you're talking about differences between the between the evm and the zk evm or no not the the mainnet evm um is, is there something that you know that's like not clear in the yellow paper ah i think that the yellow paper is quite difficult to understand I, I I think there's a whole bunch like it's it it's formal and like I also think it's a little bit out of date with the current EVM and it's definitely out of date with the current ZK EVM because like the ZK EVM doesn't include 1559 and things like that. Um, but yeah, the solidity yellow paper is just quite difficult to understand. Uh, and I think that like the place that I would check is like the newer things because I think it hasn't been. Like people have tried to keep it up to date, but it's quite difficult to keep it up to date. So I would say like the newer hard forks and 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 opcodes and things will be like one place to check. And just in general, just be careful about the the yellow paper. It's quite difficult to to understand. I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, good 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 point uh, about the newer stuff. Okay, so I've got another question in the chat uh, from Mikhail. Uh, what if the EVM is fixed change broken after ZK EVM was deployed? If a bug in EVM will be rebased as feature after discovery? Okay, so like this is basically a question about, okay, what if there's some zero day or issue in EVM? Will the ZK EVM be, uh, will be updated in the, in the, to, to include a fix for this bug? I don't know. That's a good question. Like, and that touches on like, should we have upgradability features at all? Like, should the ZKVM be be like constant without changes? And oh, that's a hard thing to think about. I like what I think is the best way to make secure EVMs will be, or to secure rollups will be to have multiple different ways of proving fraud. So you could have like two different. Uh, validity proofs and you could have two different fraud proofs and we could we could have all of these working on chain and and then users can just do whatever uh oh then, then if there's a bug in the evm it would we would need to update these four different uh different things um i'm not crazy i i'm not crazy about having an upgradeability feature especially longer because all upgradeability features are like allow you to to also just steal all the money which is not good um so yeah i don't know 
I think. I, I, I think that like there are things that we could do having upgradability features, like having like a very long delay and allowing users to withdraw. But it's not, it doesn't really give you the same, like being able to withdraw is you're still losing stuff. Like if there's contracts deployed and network effect and stuff, it's really hard to upgrade those or to withdraw those. Um, but anyway, I I think that like there's definitely a certain class of places where we would have to do an upgrade. And I don't know exactly how we would go about doing that. And I, yeah, I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. So I guess one thing I was looking for was more precision when it, when it comes to the attack model here or the attacker model. So it strikes me that you want to support everybody who is able to produce EVM bytecode of any sort of valid shape. It doesn't have to have gone through the Solidity compiler, if I understand this right, firstly. Secondly, sort of deviations I think you're talking about here, I mean, effectively uh, focus on runtime deviations under any input, is if, if I'm not mistaken, right? So in principle, there are different ways to test for that, you with, with or without relying on, you know, commonly deployed smart contracts, let's say. So can you just, you know, try to, I mean, I don't know, focusing on the attacker model, can you try to summarize that a little bit? Mm, sure, okay. Huh. Yeah, so I think because it seems person... like you know, in principle, you could have multiple attacker models too, but uh, I think it's it's helpful to spell it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I okay, so I think it's easier to have multiple attacker models. I, I think that like there's there's the attacker who wants to break a contract that's deployed, there's a, a contract, there's an attacker who's focusing on like a solidity contract that's deployed on ZKVM, and the attacker is using their knowledge of solidity and EVM in order to, and the difference between EVM and ZKVM in order to break that contract. That's one. There is an attacker who is trying to, to break the liveness of the ZKVM. And like, basically they're using, they're able to make any bytecode they want and deploy it. And, and like the attacker in the first case is also able to do that. They don't have to go through the Solidity compiler either. So. Uh, yeah, this is this is a really hard question because it's very broad, like what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about a whole bunch of different attacker models and like what other ones do we have? Um, there's there's someone who's trying to hack the, the is, is this useful? Am I answering your question correctly here or is, is something else? I think you're, yeah, I think you're partially answering my question because I was, I mean, to my mind, right? So the differentiation between like bytecode level versus uh, like uh, solidity language level is, probably somewhat helpful, I suppose, right? I mean, in a practical sense, you can have an attackers who are crafting, you know, bytecode sequences as it happens, you know, in other domains, or you can have people who just, you know, come up with uh, smallish programs that they run through the compiler and then look for differences or what have you, right? So at least those probably should be separate. That's what I'm guessing. Right, yes, that makes sense. Um... But but uh, the differences, I think you might be mixing up things a little bit here. Like in terms of teasing out the differences, I guess you're relying on different uh, under an input, right? So so uh, there exists an input under under which you can you can sort of have uh, any of the three things you have on this slide. Um, but that's that's sort of uh, how you detect problems, right? That's your aura. Mm, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely mixing up a lot of things here. Um, yeah, I, I think like in general, I think the, the scope of like the attack surface here is really, it's really broad. Um, and that's why I'm, yeah, just talking about many things at once maybe. But I think that, yeah, let me, let me answer the, Grace, am I finished time here? Should I answer the rest of the questions in the chat? Oh, sure. Just a few minutes. Uh, they just we we have a schedule after seven thirty, but that's good. We're good. Okay. 
So good to keep going or good to finish? Good to keep going. Okay, cool. Sorry, Dan. I have some some comments slash questions to uh, Mariam Jordi. Uh, well, first, some some clarifications in the case of Polygon, for example, we don't have a deep uh, limitation in the storage. Storage is a processor, so you can you can be as deep as as you want. The what's limited is the total number of hashes that the storage can do in in in, in the in the proof. Okay, but right. we don't have this limitation. So, so that's, okay, so, I think that's good on that. And, and like the limitation on the depth also enforces an implicit limitation on like the overall number of storage accesses that you can do. The overall, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. here. The thing is that, uh, of course, there is also always this limit. The, the question is that uh this if this limit is uh let's say reasonably uh reasonably high you know it's uh only a smart con this will not affect only as really mm, maybe pathetic smart contracts or smart contracts that uh, are uh really really bad but in any case this is lock n so you can maybe imagine that you can well actually you can do that in the in the patricia tree you can um because you calculate the Ketchak and then you are trying, you just try to calculate many like a vanishing uh, place and you can try to make a branch very deep so that the clients have to access more, more databases. But this is lock end. Right. So, no, no. Uh, but like, with, wait, hold on. This is somewhere where it's different because like with the MPT, the depth of the tree is dynamic. And like one of the assumptions mm -hmm. that like the MPT lets you make is uh, MPT stands for Merkle Patricia tree. It's the, it's the storage tree that's used in the mm -hmm. EVM. Uh, it, it allows you to assume that like, oh, the depth of the tree is going to be like less than this number because it's randomly assigned and like the depth of each branch is never going to grow longer than this without a whole bunch of computational work. And like, this is one thing that's different. Like that, that, that is, that's a potential assumption that Solidity could be making and that like the gas price calculations could be making and that like other implementations are not making. Well, the implementation or implementation, the, the, the path is a hash. And uh, well, it's a hash. So yeah. you can go right. deep, but limited to to some uh, some levels. You know, it's right. So, so the path is a hash and the, and the depth is unlimited. Is that correct? The depth is unlimited. Yeah, but it's, you know, you need to find, well, it's limited by the hash, it's 256 bits. But if, if you get to 256 bits, you mean, it means that you have collisions in the hash. Yeah, right. Yeah. Which is well, not like hash. You, so it's, like it's you, not. Right. You can definitely grow your tree faster than you can grow the MPT. Uh, you can grow, uh, it's about the owner case, the kind of a sparse market tree, which is similar to Patricia tree, but it's like you're limited. So you can maybe make uh, some leaf that uh, at a specific point, that's a little bit more expensive, but, uh, you know, this is maybe you, so that means that, so here, then I, I will put you some numbers, you know, for, you can, for the depth. Uh, you need to uh, imagine that you go very deep and you go to 100 bits, 100 bits of uh, hash, okay? So you just, Bitcoin doesn't have that, okay? So that's, uh, you go there. So that means that there are 100 levels. If we can do in the full, uh, in the full system, we can, we can put, we can do more than uh, a million of levels. Uh, well, you, you, you can, you can hack it, you, you know, you can, you can make it worse, but, uh, it's going to be really difficult to reach the so to reach the limit. Uh, mm. in, um, mm. Okay, that's 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 fun. I I think that like the other major different assumption here is with the snark friendly hash function. Like this is something that I would want to be careful about here too, because. Uh, but I guess the randomness doesn't really affect. Uh, wait, it's a spider smart tree, so the randomness would affect the like do you use Ketchak for the for the for the uh, for finding the address or do you use do you use uh something snark friendly well we use the we use a snark friendly for the for the tree structure itself but uh solidity so for the smart contracts uh 
they are using Ketchak to find the, uh, in general, Solidity use the Ketchak to find the storage plates. So actually it's, it. in the case of Solidity is both, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that, that makes well, me the, feel a bit better. Yeah, this is one thing, yes. the other is the, 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 the oh, yeah. So, They continue, I have more things, but it's okay. Uh, here, the famous question of the time lock, uh, um, to what a strap will have some way of updating the smart contracts, uh, for sure. I think it's a security issue. Uh, this should be, but here defining the rules. I think that Vitalik make a good point uh, in the last article of, of defining some acceptable rules there, uh, but this is a debate that, um, yeah, we can have. I don't want to. I want to be decentralized, but I also want to be safe. And if there is something wrong, in the smart contract be be able to do something at some point. And this is something that we uh, gas model. We are using gas model of Ethereum plus. The, so this is for the explicit, but then we have the implicit. Uh, the implicit are what we call the zk counters. It's uh, these resources, these limit resources in the prover. These limit resources should be reasonably high for. Uh, normal you know for normal cases but yeah uh, this is something that we need to check uh, and see all the edge cases and very interesting yeah. the point that you know these are smart contracts that so i'm not i'm, I'm not i'm not I'm, I'm my concern is not in the explicit gas it's more in the implicit gas you know that smart contracts that can make change this that can change these things interesting yeah. interesting a point here um, me, me too uh jordi one one thing to yeah. mention there is that like the other place where you definitely have implicit gas changes is the call data gas cost, like the, the, the S load and or, or the, the problem. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the problem is that the data the data cost. So the idea is that the, the, the data cost is the same in layer one and layer two. That's it. That's that's the uh, that's that's the point. And and if you want to do if you are doing layer two, is because you want to have a better gas cost, but you cannot charge the same for the gas cost in layer two. Uh, the, 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 um, so you, you need to use the same. So the, the, the real cost is the same. Other thing is uh, what uh, what you charge. Here, statistically, it's it's okay because one thing compensates the other. But an abuse of that availability is is something that the system you will be you will break some hold the, the you can break some hold the system. Mm. So also also. Your, uh, also to, implies a different gas block limit for call data, right? Because that limit is defined by the layer one gas, whereas all the other gas block limits is defined by the layer two gas. Yeah, we have a, we, one of the things that in order to prove the, so to prove is that we, in, in the smart contract of the rollup, we warranty that the quantity of data is limited because we need to prove. So our constraint or idea is that you put some data and uh, even if it's random that data you are you should be able to generate a proof maybe it's a proof that this data goes nowhere so that doesn't change the state okay it's just an operation but the proof should be always able to prove that whatever data you are putting there it can be random data it can be uh, transactions with a wrong nonce, transactions with a valid or invalid signature transactions with a wrong rlp format or you can put any that data and the prover should be able to prove that this data uh, has a state, a state transition. So you should be able to build the proof. That's the oh, wow. so, or uh, we'll say. So so you're not only proving that like the EVM is compatible with them, you're also making proofs that this is incompatible. Exactly. So this is mm. and, and this is and this is very important. This is very important for the uh, for the um, uh, what we call forced transactions. Force transactions is a layer two. It's a layer two transaction that the that the user can put in layer one, okay. And then the sequencer are forced is forced to include this transaction. This transaction can be anything. In general, it's going to be a withdraw uh, because you are probably um, blocking him. But uh, it can be any transaction there. So and it can be wow. something that's wrong. So you should be able to process that. Okay. So that's one of the hardest points that we have in the system. And yeah. this is hard, you know, it's, this is, this is the, the yeah. things that I'm a little bit scared on these forced transactions, yeah. but we need that yeah. for the forced transactions because you want to the censorship resistant in, in, in yeah. this case. That's, okay. that's a whole other audit. Like that's a whole other set of scope. Like that's, that's like 
that's not EVM. That's that's like a superset of the EVM. Like that's EVM plus a whole bunch of other things. That's yeah. That's that's big. Yeah. Well, that's that's the thing here. The well, you call validity in in the, in, the, in the second part. We call we, we use so validation in our case we do it by running the Ethereum DES. So this is for us is so we guarantee that. Uh, the EVM is doing what it's supposed to do because we are passing the Ethereum test or at least most of the Ethereum tests. This is how we guarantee somehow the validity. Of course, there are some exception, exceptions and things, and you know it's not that easy, but but that's a good starting point at least. And the critical part is the soundness, is the one that you said. So it's actually, it's like when you have a transaction, it can happen three things. Is that you can generate one proof and only one proof to be valid. Okay, so that's uh, you, you, one new state valid. Another bad thing is that you can generate two, two, two different valid states. Okay, so you can you have the same transactions and you process one way and you generate one state. You process one other way, you generate another state. Here, what we are, the, the way that we are protecting this against that is that uh, if uh, in the smart contract, if two two proofs appears that goes to different states, then the system is halted somehow. Okay, so that's something that's that's wrong in there. But there is another case, and it's the, the case where you, uh, there is some data that you cannot generate a proof. There is some uh, constraints that it's okay, this is, some, this, is this, this transaction, and it's impossible to generate a new proof that goes from this state to this new state. This is not, so you, at this point, you have to upgrade. So it's bad, but it's not uh, the worst. You know, you just upgrade the smart contract, maybe you need to wait a month, but funds are not gonna be lost. And maybe are going to be stopped, which is bad, but it's much worse if you just lose the, 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 the funds. Yeah, these is are the three things. Uh, so that that took well, the, the, the three kind of uh, mistakes, so mm, errors that make the three kinds of concerns uh, that uh, that I have. Uh, the worst thing is if uh, is the, the validity, you know, if you are doing. Uh, is that you can generate only a single proof, but this proof is is valid. It's a new it's a new state, but this state has a lot of money in my pocket. Okay, so that's that would be a bad uh, that would be the worst case scenario when you can generate only one proof, and this proof is uh, wrong. is is not valid. It's not valid validity. But I think that this with the test and good audit, it should be. Uh, I'm not going to say easy, but at least much more easy to uh, audit this part that the other two parts. Yeah, that's what I, the comments that I wanted to make. Sorry for. Thanks, Jordi. Well, that brings him nicely into his talk, I guess, Jordi. You can take the stage. Yeah, I can, I can, maybe I can continue. Maybe I, I will, I will pass the, the word to, to Jose. Jose is going to explain a little bit, uh, explain, explain a little bit how, you know, what's the criteria for uh, designing the, the, for designing the, 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 the system. Jose, maybe you want to share your screen and have the stage. But while you are sharing the screen, <clears throat> is I um, just want to say that uh, the idea of the system or system, one of the biggest one of the designs of our system is the modularity. Okay, so the idea is that we can split the things between the arithmetic gestion and the 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 the, 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 the so the and the, the functionality, the assembly code on top of that, so that uh, there is many people working in parallel in the in the same way. And this also should benefit a lot the auditing because the pieces are you know are, are relative. So there are a lot of pieces, but each piece is relatively mm, relatively small, so this should be handable altogether. But Jose, maybe you can you can you can start. Okay, nice. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm I'm going to go very quick about uh, the, the the approach that we are following uh, to build the ZKVM. You know that we can follow like a circuit based approach or state machine approach. Uh, our solution is mainly based on the state machine approach. And each of these has pros and cons. Uh, you can see the, 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 the circuit essentially is, is a set of connected gates, while a state machine is a sequence of states in which in a pure state machine, we have relationships between consecutive 
states. Um, and, and regarding performance, the, the, the main thing that you need to see is, uh, I mean, all, all these are, are, are uh, just a matrix of values. And you need to see how many how many columns, how many polynomials do you have, and and and, and which is the size of these polynomials in, in the number of values. Um, and uh, with it, we we've been seeing in these sessions about uh, different state machines. Uh, we talk about the Fibonacci state machine, and, and remember that we had like uh, all, all these relationships between values of the same state and and the next state, and we also care about this cyclic behavior. In a, in a circuit approach, uh, well, circuits are very nice to build computations that are very expressive. I mean, for example, this circuit, I mean, we can have in the, a different stage of the computations, we can have like the, just the amount of gates that we need to express our computation. This is a good thing. And then we have, we, we, in a circuit, we can have like complex relationships uh, connecting these gates. Okay. Finally, all this is translated. By the way, this is the arithmetization of Planck. This is this is translated in, in in a matrix also. So again, we have here this matrix with columns that are uh, constant and, and and columns that are uh, part of the of the values of the circuit. Okay, which is the witness of the of the circuit. Um, then, then let, let's see what which lessons do we learn for this for from these models. Uh, we must say that the ZKIBM from Polygon is, is a kind of hybrid system. Uh, in, in the pure uh, circuit model, uh, gates, I mean, gates that, uh, that are uh, used at each state of the computation can be very tailored to the computation. I mean, you don't need to use more stuff than you need. Uh, in general, there, there are like complex relationships between non-consecutive stages, okay? This, uh, this, uh, and then we don't need to assure any cyclic behavior because essentially the computation goes uh, forward, okay? In a, in a pure state machine, I, I'm talking here about pure because uh, I think that uh, all the projects in fact are building some kind of hybrid thing. In a, in a pure state machine, uh, the, 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 the relationships are between consecutive states, as I said, and we need to assure this cyclic behavior. And uh, the main problem that uh, state machines have is that you may 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 uh, may end uh, using having many columns that are not really used in the computation. But because in the you know in the state machine we the, the state always has the same amount of columns, so maybe you are not using some of these columns. Okay, so but uh, uh, when state machines really shine and they are very useful is when when the computation involves some kinds of branches. You do one thing or the other, depending on, 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 on some uh, value. There is when we find that the state machines uh, behave better uh, in this case than pure circuits. And the, the, the reason is, that is this, because I mean, imagine a circuit that we have like two possible, two possible computations. Here I have like a multiplicative Fibonacci on the upper branch and, and, and in the lower branch, I have a, an additive Fibonacci series. Okay, but finally I'm using only one of these computations depending on this E0, okay? So uh, here, most of the time I'm wasting, I'm computing one of the branches that, uh, and all the computation, all the, all the witness, all the values in the witness will be not really used, okay? so. In the in the state machine model, uh, we can create the 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 concept of an if and a jump and and and, and without wasting uh, as many resources. Uh, and, and essentially, this is uh, we are going to read if we have jumps or not from this uh, assembly, and uh, and the idea is to change from one state to the next one according to instructions okay this is this is how this is the approach of, of, of polygon among others and then to manage jumps we also introduce some uh, program counters and and we jump to the correct instruction and uh, we find that in, in this ways the in, in this way the trace the execution trace of the state machine is, is only computing really useful values okay 
And this is why uh, our main, comp the main model for the main computation is in fact a state machine. Uh, it doesn't mean that we, we are not thinking in mixing this with other possibilities, but uh, the main uh, computation is based on, on, a, on a state machine. And, uh, but the, as I said, the main problem is that if we build a, like a huge matrix with uh, a lot of columns, I, I probably we're going to end uh, with, uh, in, in, in many states, we are going to end with a lot of values that are not really meaningful. And we are just, uh, you know, nullifying them in, in some way. So the, the the other big idea when building or the lesson that we learned when, when, when building the ZKIBM, the Polygon ZKIBM, was to, in fact, split the, the, the computation in uh, several, comp in different computation execution traces. And, uh, and then the, each, each state machine, each uh, processor, is each executor. If you remember our talk of the about the, the Fibonacci state machine, is each executor is creating a, a particular piece of the of the execution trace with the correct columns for the computation that uh, this state machine is doing, and then we have the specific pill that is uh, enforcing the identities or the relationships that this trace must fulfill. And, and finally, we are building like a, an architecture in which we have like several micro processors or micro structures. Each, each of them is devoted to compute some part of, of the processing of the Ethereum transaction. And then we are connecting them. And, and then in one processor, uh, if you remember the talk of Jordi of, of the first day, he said that we have like three inputs. We have values that you can put on the main state machine without any validation because the, vali the, the validity of these values is going to be achieved in this second secondary processor. And then we do lookups to assure that this is fulfilled. And uh, well, um, this is this is I would say that this. Uh, this is this uh, different. This is structure. This is structure with different processors, uh, trying to use the correct uh, or try to use the best uh, approach, the best model for each computation and so on. Is is I think is what we have learned as we have developed the Zika IBM, uh, and uh, well, and, and with a great great vision. I I must say from Jordi, or with uh, great intuitions about which were the the, the best ones. Uh, I don't know, Jordi, if you want to complete a little bit what uh, we, had, we have learned also here. Yeah, from, from well, many, many things. Well, we learned one of the things that was interesting was the, the, the step to Goldilocks. Goldilocks just uh, reduced the, all the witness computation from 256 to 64 bits. That means that even if we have, for example, actually we have around 650 polynomials, but they are uh, 64 bits. So if you compare with, for example, with a 256 bits, then you, it's like having 150 polynomials uh, all, to, all, all, all together. Okay, so that's that's and the uh, the, process, the the execution, the witness computation, the execution is really is really is really fast. The other point. It reduces the, the you know, RAM, the, maybe, right? I mean, among other things, it reduces quite a lot. The, the, the it need reduces the RAM, but. It, uh, yeah, that, that, the, the execution is also yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's big. the other the other thing is and the other is more it's more subtle, but it's uh, uh, the fact of using uh, state machines, um, specialized state machines, you know, special state machines that they just do a very strict things, so a concrete thing. Um, um, well, this has a lot of advantages. The first is that. Uh, one of the advantages is, for example, the, the parallelization of them. So because the state machine is doing just a specific thing, and a lot of times is doing the same thing many times, um, you can parallelize this uh, quite well in general. Okay? So that's the, that's, the, the, that's the point, because uh, that, that's the thing. The second is the, the number of constraints. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this is because we put all the logic, you know, all the complex part of the logic in, in the assembly, um, the number of constraints of the system, uh, the, the polynomial identities is quite small. So we are talking with, I don't know, it's like something like 200 uh, polynomial constraints or 300 polynomial constraints. 
Uh, no, it's a little bit more. But, yeah, maybe 400. but in, in any case, it's a, it's a little bit more. It's a least number of polynomials. But it's, it's, a, it's a relatively uh, um, uh, a small number because in the arithmetization, we don't, it's just a processor. You, we don't care what's running on, on, on top of that. It's just a, it's just a, a, a processor. So this is, this is a good, um, this is a good learning. You know, the, 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 the quantity of lines of code that you need to audit in the in the arithmetization, which is the PIL, is this language that we build for that, is uh, relatively is relatively uh, small and, and concrete. Okay, and the the other thing that's important is that the PIL only affects the soundness. Okay, so the PIL don't really affect or doesn't affect very much in the in the validity part. You know, because at the end it's a processor. The processor just it's just what well, you need to well, you need to check that the processor is doing what it's supposed to do but the processor is very simple so it's very easy to 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 verify to verify uh, to verify that okay um this modularity that as i mentioned you know the the having a language a specific language is abstraction of making a language for limitation and another uh, um, abstraction of making a language for uh, building the, the ckdm itself you know the, the assembly that's building on top this is we should we simplify it a lot the um, development uh, because we can have specialized people Build, working in these in these tools of course this requires some investment in tooling but this is mainly what we have been doing so all the tooling for debugging for checking for seeing the values of this is um, uh, split so this can it, it has been very helpful to divide the work divide the work inside the inside our team but uh, this should also help a lot in divide the work between the auditors okay, an auditor can focus in the arithmetization of the catch up state machine or uh, the limitation of, of the ARIF or the of the or a procedure or a procedure that's computing the ACDSA in the ROM or a procedure that's computing the mall boot uh, opcode in the ROM or the procedure that's um, uh, parsing the RLP. So you can really uh, split the you can really split the, the pieces and uh, focus in auditing in auditing uh, uh, in auditing this 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 way okay so these are the main topics i want to share here the, the my biggest concern the biggest concern um especially is in the especially for the soundness okay i, I already told you how we are mitigating the soundness okay the soundness is that okay you the the, the, the thing is that at the beginning you will publish a, a, a proof in the system but this proof will not be usable until some time mode so that there is time for a for a good prover um, that's generating uh, a valid proof and a different proof so that it will help the system and the system and so the money will not be withdrawing this is a whole but this is but the soundness is the most difficult part to warranty and to audit and we need the, to have the soundness in order to reduce this time actually to remove this time in the best case, if you have the warranty that uh, the the, the soundness is is good, but uh, just for you to think about, if you remove all the of the all the polynomial constraints, you will be able to generate a valid proof. The problem is that you will be able to generate many valid proofs that goes to different to different ways. Okay, but the the good one you are gonna you, it's gonna be the good one. You can you will you will always be able to generate the good one. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, one of the points. And here for the, the the concern, the biggest concern probably is that the assembly language is okay. The processor is not like a standard processor; it's a processor that's a little bit different of the standard processors, and they have some uh, explicit things that are um, unique uh, to the ZK. Actually, it's a processor that's not computing things; it's a processor that's checking things okay so and and the way it works is that the way it works in general is that you put the data so the all the data that the processor use you can you can freely uh, put uh, anybody can put and then you you are just checking that this data that you put is 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 is, is okay is valid so uh, instead of so this processor does not multiply but this processor check that the, multipli the multiplication is done the right way this multiple this processor doesn't read values from the memory, but this processor checks that the value that you propose to the system 
is actually uh, in the right place in the memory. Okay, so it's a process. It's a processor about. It's more about checking than about uh, computing. And this differential, you know, this this um, uh, this this, this differential way, you need to change a little bit your mind uh, in the way you write the programs or the way you audit and you check the programs. Okay, and this is probably the most difficult uh, part that uh, we need to get used to. Uh, that is learning a new language. We did it in the in the team. Uh, it's a really new language, so it's that. Uh, but, but it's this is probably the most probably as we say this is the most uh, difficult part. And uh, yeah, this soundness. Just want to mention, for example, one of the bugs uh, that we already found. Uh, maybe Jose, you can comment. But for example, in the in the sparse Mercury tree, uh, there is an assumption that uh, I think that when you are emptying and when you are emptying the well some of some some edge cases and when you are emptying you need to do some extra validations you need to be sure that when you are removing one value from the sparse from the sparse micro tree then this value must be must exist in the system so we didn't check that this value didn't exist so uh, this could be a, a, a vulnerability so it's very much about checking everything and being sure that uh, you don't miss anything one of the tricks here is that uh, if you check the um, if you check the the ROM and you go to the ROM, uh, you will see a lot of dollars. Each dollar in the ROM that means that uh, it's a free input, okay. And the exercise here is that you need to check for every single input that you are putting uh, because it can be a random input. Actually, that this input is is it can be only it it can be only unique, you know. And this means that going through all the code and checking that. This uniqueness, so that that you are, that you are valid, verifying that all the values that you are putting in the system are okay. This is the problem. The how you warranty this, this is probably one of the things that I'm more concerned. Very interesting. The the all the points that uh, Barry made here. I think that having a good documentation of all the differences between the between the the ABM and the ZIG, and the ZIG ABM is uh, fundamental for any system. So I'm having all the details of all the systems uh, here, I can mention some of them. They are very, very uh, concrete. But for example, we one thing that we decided is to, uh, uh, well, actually it was, it's not remove, but convert the self struct in a transfer all. I think there is an EIP, for example, that's already doing that. This simplifies a lot of uh, things because actually it is, and, and this is also something that breaks Many things in the in the current EVM, uh, and uh, but you can actually can deploy like different smart contracts in the same address or redeploy things. It, it's like it's it's it has some uh, logic there that uh, with uh, removing the self struct uh, helps uh, a lot of the things. This is, for example, one of the one of the changes. Um, today we're discussing, for example, a jump uh, of a desk in the middle of uh, call data. In the middle of uh, some 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 places, some checks that you need mm -hmm. to do. Probably we are avoiding we are avoiding this. Um, uh, you know there are a lot of details uh, that uh, so there are some uh, some details that we are uh, just thinking if we consider or we don't consider. Um, here we have Carlos, uh, but I think that we uh, there are very 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 few exceptions where we are not uh, following the full compatibility of. Uh, of uh, the ZK of the ABM. And in those exceptions, for example, in this case, um, Solidity doesn't generate a code like that. So this is, for example, if you are not doing something very crazy, you will not never notice the you will never notice the difference. The big difference, of course, is this implicit gas model. We already we, we, we talk a little bit about that, but this is it's a must and, and this is probably the biggest uh, the biggest concern. Well, it's the biggest thing that we need to analyze. But the the the, first, the thing is for me is Having documented all the differences, this is the first step just to check that the smart contracts that are going to run on top are going to have uh, difficulties or, 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 or not. Okay. And uh, yeah, and just to finish, maybe just uh, share a little bit the, I want to put just a list of the things that needs to be audited. Uh, let me share the screen. Um, I stopped. Okay. Let me see. I want to put this one. Uh, this one. Just here. Yeah. Okay. 
Let's see, we'll talk. One side we have the we have the the dead in mitigation. Okay, the mitigation this includes all the all the all the, the different state machines. We don't have that many actually. We have like twelve, <laughs> yeah, like twelve uh, state machines. Uh, biggest one, the most difficult one, probably are the the the, the paddings one. The, here with the padding is the padding for for the, the ketchup, you know, the hashing. Okay, this goes together with the, the hashing ones. Okay, but the others are quite straightforward. Even the main one, it's quite straightforward. Probably that the, there is one one state machine that's like another processor itself. It's a full system itself. Is the storage. Okay, so the storage is so it's a processor where you can well, just work with this uh, uh, sparse Merkle tree. Okay, then we have the ROM. The ROM, well, we have different pieces. Here is the well, just from understanding how the assembly works and so on. Um, so how you here there is a full, a full topic of how you would strap the ROM and how you finish the ROM and this is some, something specific, how you do the RP, how you do the CDSA, um, uh, um, how you uh, do the bootstrapping of the transactions and then the smart contract deployment and the, the execution, but then you have the opcodes, the pre-compiled smart contracts, uh, counters and errors, context, reverts, and two challenges. These are different parts of the ROM, okay? But you can divide in these different uh, pieces uh, here, okay? Here we have also, the, all the, the full topic is the smart contracts. Mainly the smart contracts are two smart contracts. One is the roll-up and the other is the, the reach. This is a normal, this should be a normal, uh, so a normal uh, smart contract audit in this side. Then we have all the cryptographic part, okay? Here you have the, 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 the Mainly the Stark and the structure of the Stark that we are using. We are going to publish. I don't know if it's public already, but it's uh, we're going to publish. Uh, uh, well, well, just how the protocol works. You know, all these uh, back and forth of the Stark. And well, special topic here is in the in the on the other recursion part. We're using a lot of recursions here to to validate different segments uh, on the network of the of the network. We are aggregating proofs, so this is an important topic that uh, needs to be checked uh, here. Okay, and finally, there is a miscellaneous thing that uh, well, there are things this should not affect a lot the security, but it's good to take a look maybe at the node, the sequencer. The, the aggregators and the, 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 the bridge, the wallet, and there are different pieces in the system that you need. But you need maybe if the sequencer is using a, a private key, then this private key needs to be protected. And something that at some point we need to to to, to be checked. Okay. Here, uh, the way that uh, the plan that we have here is that uh, we are planning to freeze all the code. Let's see if during December, let's see if it uh, can be a beginning of December, maybe it's mid-December. The idea is there just to stop all the current development, developing on that. Uh, we are going to, we are going to uh, the genesis, the, the network in one, two weeks. We will we'll include in the, in the test net of the aggregator, the aggregator part, and then we are going to freeze uh, everything. So we're going to freeze everything there and we are going to focus very much in the, in the, in the auditing and, and taking a look on that. Okay, so that's a little bit the the planning that we have and yeah, the learnings and the status. Yeah, that's very much uh, what we have until here. Testnet. Thank you. Jim. Maybe I want to just check. Yeah, just say that the testnet is running has been running quite well. It, it has been we, we generated more than ten thousand. Uh, proofs since we uh, started. Uh, yeah, probably and many has not uh, stopped it. So it has just been uh, working very well. And um, the grade of compatibility that we are, well, we, have, uh, we are, we are fine, which we are getting is quite good. We need to improve a little bit the performance of the sequencer. We're working hard on that. On that front, that's probably the biggest thing that we have uh, uh, currently. And uh, yeah, let's see if we add this aggregator. But uh, yeah, it's working. It's working. It's working quite well. 
So thank you, Grace. I don't know if you. Uh, there now are I think that maybe. we. Yeah, maybe we can ask if there's a question. Otherwise, we are running a bit late, uh, 15, 13 minutes uh, late. Maybe we can take one okay. question and then continue. Uh, if we yeah. don't have any questions, I then, have no? a question if oh, you... we have time. Otherwise, I can yeah. ask it in uh, the chat. No, it's okay. You can ask. Uh, I think we have time for oh, one question. Okay, okay. So, you already mentioned uh, that uh, one of the biggest threats is uh, actually sound bad, sound is bad. So, mm -hmm. can you provide an explicit example of what can go wrong? For example, in which component uh, there might be a bug? and how an attacker could exploit. For example, if the automatization somewhere is wrong, which component will be the bad one and how someone will be able to exploit that? Yeah, mainly is uh, from the remediation perspective is that you forget uh, some, uh, uh, some constraint. constraint in the pill. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's, that's the typical thing, okay? But, uh, not, but in the wrong part, for example, Example, uh, let me put you an explicit example. Uh, imagine that you are doing a division, okay? We don't have a, an arithmetic state machine that computes divisions, that, that checks divisions, but we have a same machine that checks multiplications. So actually what you do is you put a free input, you put the result of the division, and then you just check that the result of the division times the quotient is the dividend, okay? Uh, if you don't do this check, so actually if in the ROM you don't put this check, actually I could, generate, uh, so I can put the result of the division, any, the value that I, any, any value that I want, okay? And this would, maybe we just uh, translate in uh, going to a different state uh, uh, on the system. And this would be problematic. Yeah, okay? yeah. This is a sense. simple example. This is a simple mm -hmm. example, but it's full of examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just actually <laughs> is a, the ROM is a, a full of, uh, if you see every time you see a dollar, it means that you need, there is something you need to check. And it's very, very, sense, very sense. easy to forget something. So that's one part of the question. And the other one is how someone could exploit that. For example, is it possible to give uh, malformed uh, traces that uh, has uh, what you mentioned, like that the result of a division, it's uh, different than the correct one? You need to do it. Yeah, but you need to check the particular, you know, to check the particular, the particular thing. But imagine that here for in the, I'm mean, put an example. I just explained that the addition, but for, I explained the division, but for an addition, it could be exactly the same or the subtraction. So imagine that uh, I'm doing a transaction and when I'm doing a transfer of a value, I'm just putting that, and I need to subtract my, my balance. So if I don't, if I don't check that the balance, that the subtraction is valid, I could put that, uh, uh, five minus three equals uh, 25. And then I just save in my, in my, in my balance at 25. So this, I could exploit mm -hmm. this by incrementing my balance uh, uh, in the wrong way because I didn't check that the result of a division is correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah, that's, yeah that's, thank you. That's, a, that's an example, but it's, it, you can, you can do very, very, very crazy things. Uh, uh, you have this soundness, this soundness problem. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jordi. I think we okay. have time Thank for you. now. Uh, hand this over uh, to Edu. Thank you. Hello. I'll share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I will start. So I will, I think my talk will be brief. So I will talk about two different topics. The first one is the Challenge API, which is something that we introduced in our Hello to Fork. And it's a trick that we use as an optimization for the circuits. And the other topic I will talk about is that we have a, a simplified implementations of our circuits that 
we somehow uh, put in the scope of our specs and they are written in Python. So let's start. So uh, in the original Halo 2 proving system, all the advice columns are committed uh, together in one phase. And here the advice columns is how Halo 2, uh, it's the name that Halo 2 gives to the witness. So this would be the polynomial, the values in the polynomial commitments. And with the challenge API, what we can do is split these advice columns into different phases. And in each phase, we commit uh, only the set of uh, witnesses that belong to that phase. Then uh, between those phases, uh, the prover can request challenges. So that's a random value from the verifier. And these challenges can be used in the constraint. So these challenges are exposed to the circuit. And the way we uh, turn this into a non-interactive is, as always, using Fiat Shamir. So here is a, a small diagram of how it would work. And basically, the only thing that we need to concern on the API level is to define which columns or which witnesses belong to each phase, and then how many times we want to query challenges from the verifier at each phase. And then the prover and the verifier will reply this and get the same challenge, and they will use this challenge uh, for the proof generation and proof verification. And then the prover is able to use these challenges in the constraints. So now let's see where we use this. So in general, we use this uh, challenge API to compress values that don't fit in the field by using random linear combination. So for example, the APM word is 256 bits, and we are using a field that is around 253, 55 bits. So an APM word doesn't fit. So one way we could solve this issue is by splitting the word into uh, high and low values, but that already has some issues because you need to uh, do a range check on each of those. So maybe you need extra stuff. So what we do is on the following this uh, challenge API, on the first phase, we would commit 32 8-bit values, which would be constrained to be between uh, 0 and 255. There is a typo here. So we know that they are work we constrain these values to be bytes. Then we get a challenge. Uh, we commit uh, the word in RLC. RLC stands for random linear combination. And then we constrain that this WRLC is equal to the random combination of these bytes. So with this, we now have a value which will be in a particular witness in a column of the second phase. And with this value, we can do equality and inequality checks of words just using one value. So for instance, if we have lookup tables that contain words, we can check if a word is in the table or not and just taking one column uh, in the lookup table. So that's one case. And the other case is for dynamic length uh, byte arrays. So uh, in general, if we have a dynamic length byte array and we want to do a lookup using that array, we would mostly need to split that into several lookups. But with the RLC, what we can do is similar to before, but now instead of taking 32 values, we take n 8-bit values. Uh, we commit them all, then we get a challenge, then we commit the RLC of this array, and then we add the constraint uh, to force that this uh, RA, the array RLC, is equal to the random linear combination of its byte of its bytes. And with this again, we can do a equality or inequality checks of this array uh, just using one value, and it doesn't matter how big the array was. And we use this trick for to verify catch-ups. 
So what this allows us is that we have an array that we want to hash. And instead of maybe doing one lookup per ketchak uh, f, so that's the function that runs uh, iteratively and keeps absorbing a list of bytes, we can uh, take all the bytes and calculate the RLC. And then with a single lookup, we're able to prove uh, we're able, we're able to match uh, this byte array from one place to another. And in this case, the, the lookup would be uh, a table that contains the result of the verification of the Ketchak verification. Uh, yeah, we actually, for this case, we also want to look up the size of the array, because if you have uh, arrays where all the bytes are zeros, uh, different length arrays will result into a random linear combination that is zero, so you need to distinguish them. So we also add the length to the lookup. Uh, so some final notes on this challenge API is that uh, we are adding some complexity to the proving system. And in turn, we get this optimization where we can uh, get equality checks or inequality checks with one value. And the downside of this API challenge API is that it makes it more difficult to split circuits or proofs. In, so if we, if we have different circuits and we want to calculate different proofs for each circuit and then aggregate them, uh, if these circuits are doing lookups from one to the other, and they are using RLC, they require the randomness to match. So these circuits need to commit, uh, then derive a challenge that is the same for both circuits, and then use this challenge in a, in a, with uh, a witness of a second phase. So it makes it hard to uh, split circuits, and we have some ideas on how to do that, but it's a bit tricky. Uh, so this is the first topic. Maybe I will ask if there are some questions about this topic. I don't see that. Uh, what's up oh, here? The what's cool about my friend? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, what's cool about the uh, challenge API is that we can actually we implement the lookups and uh, multi-set equality and uh, copy uh, equalities on top of the challenge API as a chip. Uh, and then we can remove it from the, the Halo 2. Uh, in fact, uh, there are also things, this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's all, it's not. So it was not a question, right? It was a comment? It was a comment. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so if there are more questions, maybe you can ask later while I will continue. So the second topic is uh, this Python simplified implementation that we have that I think can be useful for auditors. Uh, it's very useful for us to review the circuits. So on one hand, we have the circuits that in our case are written with Halo 2, and these can be tears and verbose. So if you just get uh, an implemented circuit, sometimes it takes more time and effort to understand what's going on. And then on the other side, we have the circuit specification, which is much more concise and easy to, um, to follow, but we cannot play with it. And by play, I mean, that you have a spec that gives a list of constraints, but you cannot uh, put some numbers and test if those constraints pass. You can do it mentally, but not automatically. So we found a middle ground, and it's that we have most of our circuits implemented in a simplified way in Python. So for instance, every time we have a, a polynomial constraint, uh, what we do in the Python uh, implementation is we just use an assert on equality checks for arithmetic expressions. 
whenever we would like to define a lookup, we just do an assert that uh, a list of values or a list of expressions belong to a hash table or to a list. And with this, we achieve a higher level of readability, but we can play with different inputs, test some assumptions, try to break it, uh, uh, iterating quickly. And here I have two examples. So this one is a snippet from our state circuit. And in this case, this circuit is modeled as the verification of the transition between one row and another. And for instance, here we can see that we have ifs. And of course, in a circuit, you cannot do ifs. But the idea is that as a circuit developers, we know how an if is translated to a circuit, it gets, uh, it doesn't look as clear as an if in Python. So here we may just read an if with the understanding that we can see the match of this if and the corresponding expression, and we can do this translation very mechanically. So in this case, when we have an if, uh, with a statement, we just an expression, we just multiply the expression to the constraint. And we if we have a negation, it just one, one minus the expression. So in this case, for instance, we can see that uh, just uh, an, an equality to zero, we are just here, just, we just have an assert. Uh, the ifs is, a, as I said, here in this case, we just have an if. We don't have very strict rules, we just try to make it easy to understand and uh, give uh, all the details so that when the circuit is implemented, the translation should be mechanical. So for instance, here, this could be a range check with a, an, a polynomial expression. In this case, since it's just two values, we don't need to do a lookup. And we even have nested ifs, which would just be applying the rule of translating an if to an expression. You can just write this into a, an arithmetic expression and so on. Or here, there is an assert range. So we would expect to have a table with all the possible values and then uh, do a lookup. And also another good thing about this is that it makes it easier to test some inputs and debug uh, uh, constraints that don't pass because this is Python. So if the assert fails, you will just get exactly the line and a trace of where it failed. And here is another quick example. This is from the copy circuit. And in this case, uh, this uh, Python simplification models the idea of having different rotations so that from one constraint, we can access three different rows. And we just model this by passing a list of rows and using indexes to access one, uh, the first row, the second, or the third. And in this case, uh, as I said, we are not very strict of how we model this because this, the aim is to make it easy to understand. So here there is this type, which is the constraint system, constraint system which just uh, mimics the uh, an object that outputs uh, expression. So for instance, here the condition is the same as an if. It will multiply all the constraints contained within this part here. Uh, it, it, all the constraints will be multiplied by this kind of selector. Uh, so here are some caveats about this. And it's that, uh, so even though we have this simplified implementation, matching it with Halo 2 is the best effort. So it requires manual checking. And usually that's been done so far with the reviewers. So all the circuits that we have written, we first write this Python version, and then we do the Halo 2. And it's easy to, it's easier to verify the correctness uh, of the constraints in the Python version. And then for the circuit version in Halo 2, we just need to make sure that the translation is correct. Uh, so we require manual checking and there's no automated way to verify that both are equivalent. 
which would be a nice thing to have, but currently we're not working on that. And in particular, we have uh, some simplifications that go beyond uh, translating for just to give an example. In the EVM circuit, each step takes a variable number of rows, but in this Python implementation, we have just modeled each step as like a single object. So from one step, you can uh, write constraints to verify the next step, but we lose the concept of uh, rows. And that's uh, the end of the second part and also the end of my presentation. So if there are any questions, comments, Uh, so one quick question about the spec. Um, yes. So basically, like your current spec is essentially you can think of as kind of reference implementations of the circuits. So did you did you get a chance to identify if there's any bugs in the spec, like why you're maintaining the, uh, the, the 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 code base of the Python code? So we have identified many bugs through the this Python implementation, and the process that we follow. Mm -hmm. is that first we write the Python implementation and then we have a review uh, a review process with our peers. And in that phase, we find we, we have found a lot of bugs. Okay. Then uh, we fix the bugs that we encounter. And then after that Python implementation is merged, then we work on the Halo 2 circuit implementation. I see, I see. I also have one uh, quick question. I have seen that in your Python implementation, you have like uh, something like um, a unit test for each circuit. Uh, is it yes. possible to actually provide something like uh, what we can provide to the scroll uh, ZKVM, basically uh, some execution traces that will run through the whole uh, ZKVM? Is that possible to do it with uh, the Python implementation? No, currently not. Um, I mean, Should it's it doable, like... but we don't have oh, okay. uh, that oh, prepared. Okay. okay. And if that was the case, then uh, for any input that uh, you could give in uh, the Python implementation, the, out, the final output uh, that said that. Uh, for some execution traces, you can't produce a proof, should be the same across the two systems, right? Yes. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, so if there's no other questions, we can hand over to Aurel. Hi everyone. Hopefully you can share this. Do you see the screen? Yes, we can see a screen. All right. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so um, I would like to talk uh, a bit about the uh, ZKVM of uh, Scroll and PSE. Um, so we had a, a big introduction already, uh, very detailed from uh, Haitian over the past uh, sessions. So this is a continuation of that. Uh, and for auditors, right? so um, let's propose a, a mindset here. So when we design things and implement, usually we think first of completeness, but just just natural. Uh, but uh, auditors should focus almost only on soundness and avoid biases from the uh, witness generation course. So biases from the intent of it and 
this sounds uh, obvious as a generality, but when you're dealing with like many things, I have definitely done that mistake myself. Um, when you lose track of if you have seen something checked in the witness generation or was it in the circuit, right? So obviously it has to check in the circuit. Uh, and I propose to make checklist, enumerate uh, the threads, uh, and document anything that's like not obvious or that's confusing, that uh, is maybe not a bug, but is, is dangerous, right? And also find it useful to document the, the positive finding, meaning things that were actually checked and are correct and are good uh, from the point of view of the auditor. And this is useful. And I, we have also found bugs like this um, based on someone sending uh, positive findings and then someone else, then like triple checks, and then this leads to, to finding a bug. So we post as much as possible. Uh, this is always useful. And the rest of our slides, they are uh, basically the worst kind. So it's just a, a list. Um, so all the explanation about how it works, I refer to previous sessions uh, by Haishan and uh, the spec, Python uh, implementation, and, and so on. So here I'm only giving a, a list of pointers uh, for inspiration, I hope to inspire. Um, so some more generalities. Uh, you want to look at how these cells are wired or, or the, the witness. Right? So usually a cell is a, is a connection between what comes before and what comes after. Normally it participates in two or, or more constraints. There are exceptions, but that should be the best case. Exceptions need to be reviewed very carefully. Um, and it's very easy to accidentally have separate cells that are supposed to be the same one or that are supposed to be copies. And the reason for that, oh, one example is that someone writes a function and they allocate everything that they need so that the function is easy to use. But then someone else comes in, tries to use two such functions, for instance. And it looks like how it, this is how it works and, and this is the only way to use those functions without changing them. And you end up with two different sets that are not connected and they're always supposed to be the same. So that, that's, that are things that happens even when, when you know it, it shouldn't. Um, so when checks, so that's the, the most obvious thing, uh, also easy to forget. Also it has to be on every cell, right? If you have like two cells, um, do not forget. So how, how the EVM does a uh, range checks? So it's either a Boolean checks, so simple constraints, or it's lookup uh, bytes. So there's a, a table with all the 256 values of uh, bytes, then combinations of those bytes as a, as a sum. And then there are also the function tables. So those are functions of two bytes input to one byte output, and implicitly, uh, those three values are also checked. So that's, that's another way to do branch checks. Um, uh, also the branch checks, uh, they, they are done a lot using simply by putting the values in the right column. So it's an entire column is a range check to be bytes. So just have to check that it's, the entire column is kind of connected to its uh, bytes lookup. Uh, then they are checking constraints, of course. So there is a lot of Boolean logic or some uh, arithmetic or on the ring right? or on, like normal normal numbers uh, and check that this is done correctly, that there are no overflows and such. So again, not just uh, completeness, but soundness. It's like two ways uh, in implication. And uh, as was explained earlier, uh, we expect everything to be deterministic. So the initial state, like the, the hash of the state roots and the final state, the next uh, hash of this uh, state roots, that should be completely deterministic based on the data that is also on mainnet. Uh, there might be exceptions, there are like little pockets of non-determinism. 
in some places, for instance, for uh, equality checks or for division and stuff. Uh, but the outcome should be completely deterministic. Then to go specifically in how we use uh, Halo. So that, that's the mental model here. This is, uh, we, we say columns, the polygon team says the polynomial, that's the same. And the gates, they are applied uh, on the entire columns on every rows. And that's why we need selectors. So selectors, yeah, the gates would be like columns. Yeah. Um, and this is a good representation here because you see that the gates, they tend to use multiple rows. And also they are holes. There are some cells that are not used. Wow. So that's something to know. Um, difference, in, in case uh, you learned about Halo 2 from some other place, uh, we use it quite differently. Um, so in particular, in the game, the selectors, they are all dynamic. So when they are static, it's easy because it's, it's at comp compile time. Uh, it just has to be, be right there. But in the VM, they are dynamic. So we have to check that first the range of the selectors, so they can be Boolean or they can be multi-valued. Uh, there are some places where it's zero, one, or two. Uh, this sort of thing, so right? there's some, we could say selector is like the instruction of the, the opcode of the instruction. So uh, need to review all the, these ranges. Uh, need to make sure that these selectors are actually enabled, right? Because Hoover could just put some zeros everywhere. Um, so there must be some logic there. And generally we have to think about every row and every possible combination of selectors. So, so when the selectors, they can be multi mutually exclusive and some can be independent, uh, activated at the same time. So we have to, to, to think about what happens in all cases. And again, at every row. So that was the generic. Then we have a little difficulty here in this structure of the columns is that uh, usually the data it doesn't match the size of the column, so we're going to need some padding. So then you can ask, is it possible to have padding in the middle or not? Um, what does the padding mean? Can it be misinterpreted by something else? Right. And we have an, another kind of padding, which is for zero knowledge, which is the blinding factors. Um, that's something we want to remove, but right now it's there and it, it complicates things a little. Uh, so that's that's something to to look at. All right, so about Halo 2, what we modified. So mostly we don't use the circuit builder of Halo 2. We have custom constraint builder. Right. Each circuit has its own way uh, with some business logic inside. So all those things that you might have learned from some other tutorials, let's say, they don't really apply, but uh, like the custom constraint builder fights a little bit with the uh, built-in Halo 2. So uh, it's good to check uh, that, that this works. We want to disable the ZK features. So for instance, there are no blinding factors in the commitments and probably we're going to remove them in the tables as well, like both uh, blue ones. Uh, so that will simplify things if we do it, but just then we need to check that this was disabled correctly. Another important change is uh, it uses the uh, KZG polynomial commitment with the, the Planck uh, multi-open uh, protocol. So this uh, needs to be checked as well. I guess there will be a scope for that. And see if there is no, no consequences uh, unintended in the protocol. That's something about the degree or anything else. Another change, uh, the instance is given as a polynomial evaluation, not a polynomial commit. But the authors made sure to still include the instance. They still committed, just 
by hashing instead of uh, polynomial commitments. So that looks good. You put the reference there. And the multiphase proof that was just explained in previous talks. Besides that, then we can look at the EVM. So all these circuits, they, they tend to have a, a structure like this, where there is a start and an end and some intermediate values. So since the gates they apply on every row, you, you need to really understand the logic of what makes a row the, the first one or the, the second one, uh, and when it ends and when the next thing starts, uh, and when the padding starts. So that's initial final conditions. Um, in the example of the process of circuits, well, that processes instructions, uh, its initial states and final, this is called the begin block and end block. And then you have uh, some nesting inside. Right? Then you have begin and end transactions, then you have call, you can have nested calls, and then return, return. So um, you need to check in the state transition that the, the context uh, are, are managed uh, correctly. So one way that contexts are managed is with the call ID that you will find in, in the source code. Uh, and that must be unique. And right now we use uh, another field, which is called read write counter uh, to generate this call ID. So also need to check that this is a, uh, a good idea, that it uh, fulfills the uniqueness. And we need to check that the everything like memory and storage and stack and, and other things, they, they are scoped. So there is the scope of a transaction and there is the scope of a contract call and nesting. So something to look at how this is done. Next, we have the steps inside of the process also. That's one cycle of the, of the EVM. So it looks like this. This is what I was referring to, where you have some selector that says this is the beginning and this is continuation. And you need some counters so you need to check the logic of how what this row comes after this one and how this one comes after this one. Also, these steps, they are variable size, as shown on the example here. So there is some logic that from the, this row here, it uh, tries to look if in which position is the next one, right? So this needs to be enforced. And everything inside this state needs to be copied or updated. For example, the program counter must be plus one in the uh, right row and all the other fields of, of, the, of the state. And this must happen in all cases, like all code, all error states and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So in all cases, all registers are updated. And some of these columns here, in the, in the processor, uh, something I mentioned, they need to be connected to lookup tables. So also check that this is all connected because you could fill this table independently and the connection to lookups happens uh, afterwards in the way, right? First you fill the column, uh, the, the table, and then you say which ones are looking up into which of the columns. Uh, so check connection. And some of those cells here, they are not used. So it's a little funny to have uh, so many cells that are not constrained. So probably it's, it's worth thinking a, a bit about this. Then of course you need to look at the implementation of every of code. You need to look at the semantics of something that uh, was also uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, like there are so many details of EVM that, that smart contracts might rely on. Uh, just, just very many and some, some are not obvious. Uh, so I don't know how to make a comprehensive list of all the details. Right? So maybe going through all the EIPs and all the yellow paper and looking for things that look funny, as I say, if you understand funny. 
so some examples here. Then there is how lookup tables are used. So in Hello2, it's intended to be static, just like the selector. And in the EVM, it's uh, all dynamic. So that means the content of the table to be looked up, it has to be constrained. And every single cell of it has to be constrained. Otherwise, that could be, maybe it's, it would be like an, a, a write in the memory. You can write anything you want because there are no constraints on that cell. Uh, we have found, uh, like, like the team has found some, some bugs of this uh, kind. Then to check the way that uh, the read write uh, hazards or consistency uh, are, are verified. This involved the call ID from earlier and what's called the read write counters, which is the recycle counter, basically, like how many operations happened. There is also support for reversible uh, writes for when uh, contracts uh, revert. So go one, uh, one level up in the stack and throw away the changes. Um, then a lookup table, usually we put multiple uh, small tables into one big uh, column uh, and those are isolated using tag but that was explained in, a, in an earlier talk so we need to check that this is uh, proper that the tags are correctly used everywhere uh, and we can also we have also fixed tables so not just dynamic and uh, we need to check also the compile time uh, like generation of those tables So then uh, something that was also mentioned already. So uh, there's the RLC, it's, it's a way to compress uh, many values into one. So that equalities and lookups are a lot cheaper, but this is, uh, this is very difficult to get it right. Um, and as of now, it is not, it is kind of mocked. So by the time this gets into the audit, uh, it will, uh, be fixed, I suppose, and this needs to be verified. Like this is everywhere, so there, there needs to be a pass of looking at all things that are called RLC in the code and check that uh, they are sound in the way that was explained earlier, um, so that all inputs are committed uh, correctly. Um, so, but this is very counterintuitive. Uh, I recommend uh, to read uh, this uh, chapter five of uh, Justin's book here. Yeah. Uh, really, this is, it, it explains exactly with examples of some problems uh, when doing Fiat Shamir. Uh, and the multi-phase proof, so that was explained earlier. This is a way to, to do it uh, soundly. Uh, but also it's done in uh, Hello2 in the look of this is there is already RLC inside. And so it's also uh, a good idea to use that, um, to use the API that, uh, that does it correctly inside. All right, so more on Fiat Shamir, you need um, all the inputs to be, to be hashed, to be part of the instance. And the input is not just about the circuit. So you, you cannot think only about the circuit. You have to think of the entire protocol. So everything that goes into the transaction that asks the mainnet smart contract to do something. So everything that's input into that, this needs to be also part of the instance of the circuit, needs to be committed at the beginning of the proofs. And then we need to check like the flow, how, how, how is this data, uh, um, how the, is the quality between these inputs at different stages uh, achieved? Uh, then in scope, there's going to be uh, verifying the, the aggregation, so which is a, a secret verifier in circuits. Um, this has transcript part, this must verify the case, so there's a way to compile the gates of the EVM into uh, uh, an aggregator verifier and then the crypto of it. So crypto is pretty complicated because it's a non-native uh, elliptic or arithmetic inside. And uh, so in scope, I suppose, will be the contract verifier 
and how it does with transition, how it accepts. And we also not forget the supply chain of uh, all the dependencies of, of everywhere. So good to check always. We can also attack the prover, maybe. So this is uh, an, an exception to the first thing uh, I was saying, but we, we do care about the security of the prover uh, because this could, maybe some malicious transaction or some, some incorrect uh, block data could crash the prover, but right? somewhere or, or, or if the prover is not able to generate a proof, this was also discussed just earlier, uh, what happens when the election chain is stops? That's also not acceptable. Um, going to be fairly difficult to reason about the resources of a circuit. We also had the discussion about the charge limit and so on. So the way it's done now, I believe it, it, it's uh, those steps. So first there is the block, and then the trace, and then finally the state transitions. So what if you have a problem in the last step, right? If it's not possible to make a proof or the prover crashes or it just doesn't have enough resources, you need to go back to the block and exclude that transaction from it, right? Make, make a block that actually can be proven. Uh, so this source of reasoning, right? That I'm proposing. Uh, and everything else, all ways of crushing software, denial of service. So that was just a, a list. So now probably several of those issues are worth an entire discussion of their own. So please do uh, discuss it with us. And that is all. Anything you want to um, go back to, maybe? I, I zipped through it, but this is intended. Uh, we can uh, uh, go over these slides again. But, uh, that will be shared as well. Okay. And so I hope people get uh, more ideas about things to check. So bigger checklists. <laughs>